Hi there. The Belt and Road Initiative, with its roots in history and an eye on the future, has become a massive platform for cooperation and engine of growth. China reiterates that the purpose of the initiative is economic cooperation rather than a geopolitical or military alliance. But criticism and doubt persist. As the world leaders convene in Beijing for the second Belt and Road Forum, what can we learn about the progress and prospects of the Global Infrastructure Initiative? How can qualitative development be boosted in BRI cooperation? And what will it take to satisfy the critics? To discuss these issues and more, I'm very happy to be joined in the Beijing studio by Zhou Ray, chairman of the Bridge Tank, Zun Ahmed Khan, visiting fellow at the Belt and Road Strategic uh, Institute of Tsinghua University, and Liu Qian, associate professor from the Belt and Road School of Beijing Normal University. We will also be joined of our satellite by Vladimir Yakunin, chairman of the supervisory board of the Dialogue of Civilizations Research Institute in Moscow. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rui. Welcome to our discussion here. First of all, your impression about the keynote presentation that Xi Jinping delivered at the opening ceremony of the second forum BRI. What do you think of the major point, Dr. Liu? The voice is really uh, loud for the President Xi for the Belt and Road Forum. Uh, it's a very, it's my pleasure that uh, yesterday I also attended the thematic forum for the Belt and Road Forum yesterday on the think tank exchanges. And I can feel that the atmosphere is very supportive and everybody are talking about the Belt and Road. So uh, I should say it's very successful. So today, this, this morning, we all listen to the President Xi's speech. And from that, we can learn uh, several points. For example, like President Xi delivered uh, five measures for the deepening opening up to uh, for the deepening of PAP, like the uh, inter intellectual property protection, like the uh, effectively involving in the macroeconomic policies, and also for the opening up policies, etc. So I think it's time we should concentrate on more on soft infrastructure. I think all of this belongs to soft infrastructure. Good beginning for a nice brainstorming, Dr. Liu. Congratulations, uh, Zong. I'm afraid you'll focus on CPAC, uh, or you'll show great interest on a wide range of issues concerning BRI this time around. Yes. Well, um, if I may also add to what Dr. Liu said, and taking forward my specific interest on CPAC, I think what's most fascinating about the Second Belt and Road Forum, and the way even CPAC has, to, has uh, emerged from Phase 1 to Phase 2, is that we're talking about the Green Belt and Road Initiative. Mm -hmm. We're talking about stability, a stable economic environment. We're talking about sustainability. We are talking about people along the Belt and Road. We're talking about cultural, uh, cultural exchanges, education, vocational training. So from the first BR BRF, which was also an immense success, the conversation was more about infrastructure, energy, the basic requirements that countries were starved for. And now that to a certain degree, and if I may say to a great degree, that idea has been successful, now we are coming to the second phase to utilize that infrastructure and to say that it's not just immediate job creation, it's sustainability for lives. And I think this is the biggest achievement and the required leadership that Eurasia and other parts of the world have been seeking. In Ozone, uh, most of the Chinese observers who follow the process of CPAC uh, may have noticed uh, the recent killings of a dozen or so people in Beluska, yes. Pakistan, where Godar port is located. Uh, what do you think of our concerns about the political uncertainty in your country? Or do you think uh, with the newly elected president and his vision for BRI, particularly the deep-rooted friendship between our two countries, that could be easily brushed aside and look forward to something positive. You know, Mr. Roy, I think there is absolutely, there's no need to brush aside. Mm -hmm. Everything that is, that is a part of Pakistan is something that we are holistically looking at. If we brush it aside, we don't address it. And that is something we cannot afford to do. If you look at the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor itself, the 22 projects that are being implemented successfully, even after the government transition, after the new prime minister's election, we see that in and of itself the scope of BRI in Pakistan, as CPEC, has been enhanced. 
And on the same side, uh, simultaneously, if we look at those things, those factors that could harm perceptions or could sabotage to some extent, those factors have been reducing. The killings last week were unfortunate, but if we look at the numbers of incidents, they have reduced dramatically for the past eight, seven years, and especially because Pakistan, with China's help, is focusing on eradicating certain elements that could sabotage in the future. I wouldn't uh, uh, go back to the bloody blast that killed well over 300 people in your neighboring country mm -hmm. of uh, Sri yeah, Lanka, because yeah. we'll talk about the uh, um, rosy picture of a BRI on this festive occasion of the second forum. Mm -hmm. So Ray, um, I wouldn't also talk about the fire that destroyed mm -hmm. the Notre Dame uh, Cathedral. What do you think of the differences, if any, between the first forum and the second BRI, uh, well, particularly with regard to the high quality development? Yeah, I was about to say, if there's one word, it's high quality. So you, you take away my answer. And this one word, what is important is that it was articulated across uh, different uh, layers and perspectives. That sustainable uh, projects, that sustainable renewable energies, that's job creation that lasts over the, uh, the, 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 the realization of the infrastructure. And what I think matters most is the understanding that large SOEs should go towards the smaller companies, the medium companies from China, but also from other countries, uh, which are where the job creation, the opportunity of job creation and know-how transfer lies. And I think this addresses the critics already, especially the critics of reciprocity, the, the critic of uh, joint ownership about the initiative. Uh, I think it, it's an important qualitative process. This was in the words of the President's speech, but this was in the words of each and every official since mm -hmm. the previous sub-forums that prepared today's forum. China has uh, enough reasons to be proud of uh, our infrastructure investment along stretches of BRI. However, we have to do more to brush suspicions concerning, for example, the debt trap, mm -hmm. as well as why it's the Chinese enterprise that benefit most from our uh, investment in the, the infrastructure. But let me cross over to Mr. Vladimir Yakunin in Moscow, because uh, uh, there is this chronic issue about whether the Euro -E Economic Union, Euro Asian Economic Union and the Belt and Road Initiative could be put together in the same basket. Russian President Vladimir Putin in fact, is invited to address the Belt and Road Forum again. How do you view Putin's participation in both the first and the second forums? And what can you tell us about Russia's participation in the Belt and Road Initiative since the first forum, Vladimir? Well, first of all, I suppose this is absolutely true to say that participation of President Putin in this forum is the reflection of the geostrategy and geopolitics of both countries, Russia and uh, China, of course. I suppose this is not necessary to reflect the specific relations established between two leaders. Now we are talking absolutely pragmatically. And from this point of view, I suppose that the Belt and Road Initiative should be read much wider than usually experts and politicians are trying to describe it. Because now, to my mind, the entire world is seeking some new ideas concerning the future model of social and economic global development. Participation of Mr. Putin <coughs> in Beijing Forum reflects that both our leaders they are also deeply involved in new structuring of the relations between two countries in the global context, of course. President Xi and Putin signed a joint declaration on cooperation in linking the construction of the Silk Road Economic Belt and the Eurasian Economic Union in May 2015. What parallels can be drawn between the two frameworks? And how can China and Russia tap more economic potential under the BRI EAEU alignment? Um, I suppose this is obvious that the signing of this agreement in May uh, 2015 was a great step forward 
in developing some special relations, pragmatic relations between two countries. Of course, on the surface, we are talking about the development or merging of Belt and Road Initiative and the Euro-Asian Economic uh, Union. But practically, we are talking about principally new model of geoeconomic and geopolitical collaboration. Central Asia has uh, assumed an important role in the BRI blueprint and has been actively participating, but warnings such as economic encroachment continue. What's your take on the criticism and how does Russia perceive China's presence in the five former Soviet republics of Central Asia? Uh, it is my personal opinion that this kind of sentiments, you know, they are kind of reflection of the previous political mentality. Of course, there are a lot of uh, difficult issues in construction of a new relations, international relations, and it is obvious that small countries, small people, they are always concerned about the practical intentions and power of the of much greater neighbor. But I suppose this is reminiscent of the Cold War mentality. Now we observe that the world is changing. The entire structure of global pol politics and global economy are changing either. And from this point of view, I suppose it is very important that the leaders of China, specialists, they are always were stating that it is for the countries to decide which way of cooperation, what scale of this cooperation the particular countries would like to implement. It is not forceful, you know, on the part of China to persuade the country to accept loans or, you know, to do something. It should be in the general planning, state planning, of the particular countries, what amount, what volume of this cooperation is necessary for the particular economy and for the particular people. Thank you. That's Vladimir Yakunin. Uh, let's look at a major issue that has really worried President Trump. Italy recently became the first G7 country and developed the country to sign up to the BRI. So, Ray, what does that mean? to President Emmanuel Macron, uh, what does Italy's entry mean for the initiative and what consequences uh, uh, will Italy's uh, endorsement have for other members of G7, Dore? Mm. First of all, I want to be clear. You mentioned about Mr. Trump. I think France is, till today, taking decisions irrespective of the American position. France is a sovereign country and is very keen to, to, to keep its sovereignty in international relations. But France, and especially the current government of Emmanuel Macron, is also very keen to use the current changes in the world economy and in the world uh, to, 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 to renew uh, the European Union, to have a kind of a renaissance. In that respect, I think the Belt and Road Initiative is rightly perceived as an important initiative, not just an economic one, but also an attempt to contribute or uh, remodel, reshuffle the, the global economy and the global uh, governance. So uh, Mr. Macron is very attentive to that. Uh, he would have preferred that there is a coordinated uh, discussion, but sometimes you don't know what you want in politics. But I think he rightly used the signing of Italy uh, with the Belt and Road as a way to trigger a massive innovation, which was to convey Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Juncker to Paris and then uh, kind of uh, have the two discussions converge, the bilateral discussions and the EU multilateral with China discussion converge. And that's, that's a positive move if we want a, a last, lasting outcome, I think. Thank you so much. You're watching Dialogue with Dr. Liu Chen, uh, Dr. Zhong and uh, Mr. Zhou Rei. We are also talking to Vladimir Yakunin focusing on uh, what's going on at the second BRI forum in Beijing. 
particularly the issue of a high quality development. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Welcome back. So, let's look at uh, Italy. Uh, French, the French people are always proud of enjoying the spirit of the Fifth Republic, heritage of uh, the Gore, meaning very much independent from uh, uh, its alliance of the uh, Atlantic Ocean. What does that mean for you who have long observed the development of BRI because the United States keeps a, a watchful eye on this? Well, I think that we've reached a point, the biggest success of China's own growth and increasing, um, I would say, uh, goodwill in the world is that it's become the most important country for many nations to understand the relationship with. So for France and many other countries to realize that their uh, how they posture themselves with China in terms of their own self-interest, in terms of their own national goals, their own economic goals that they have, and uh, to understand that their, um, the result of a relationship that's independent of other influences with China can be of benefit to them. So I think uh, it's not just France, but many other countries that feel that their uh, policy towards China, towards Pakistan, towards other nations has to be independent if they are to determine their own interests. Everybody is studying the impact of a Brexit. Uh, the United Kingdom is leading continental Europe and President Donald Trump will soon visit uh, London uh, between June the 3rd and the 5th uh, to see Queen Elizabeth. Uh, so uh, having said this, uh, uh, we have to remind uh, our guest speakers that it is UK that first joined the AIIB. This time around it's mm -hmm. Italy that uh, sign, signs up for BRI. Does that indicate that uh, uh, European Union, which is already fragile, will fall apart, particularly on the issue of a BRI? That's a very good question. I think it's a good time for Europe to participate, the whole participate, the belt and the road, but in case that American will play an important part in the involvement. Because so we all know that the American are doing this kind of thing like the hyper against uh, the Belt and Road. So uh, actually, uh, they in voting all the resources uh, to give us the right misery to some countries don't follow his part. So I think maybe Italy also face this misery threat. So um, I think it's a, it doesn't matter because um, actually China and the U.S. have different culture and the, after the Second World War, uh, U.S. has dominated the whole world, Western world, until now. So that's why Europeans are afraid of uh, a little bit for the American participation, uh, the involvement. Uh, like, so um, mm, I think from our side, we should pay attention to why there are some people they are hyper against the Belt and Road. Uh, because they don't know about it very well. Joe Ray, if some in the West uh, go as far as to compare BRI to the Marshall Plan that the United States introduced in the mm. week of the Second World War to help uh, Europe reconstruct the mm. war torn continent, mm. and that also includes the UK, of course. So, do you think this is a, a feasible parallel comparison, or is this a far fetched uh, uh, an approach by some of those who think? Uh, who think that the uh, BRI is a conspiracy theory, theory to replace the current world order? Well, you know, my personal view is that the BRI is much more than uh, the Marshall Plan. It's like somehow a recreation of the UN with all its departments, with its financial wing, with its uh, arenas for expression, with its uh, infrastructure and projects department and also with its cultural exchanges. But getting back to the Europe, Europe survived uh, all initiatives and I don't think that Europe is fragile and I think that Europe as a whole wants to embrace cooperation with others on its own terms, on its own negotiated terms. So for Europeans it doesn't matter really what uh, the Belt and Road should be compared to but what it is in the details and I think that the second forum has given details has uh, given some practical tools and I, I am hopeful that European countries and the EU will advance and that we'll see advancements in the third forum to come. 
zone. China is making heavy investment in ports of uh, Mediterranean countries such as uh, Greece and Italy. At the same time, Premier Li Keqiang attended uh, the annual event of uh, 16 plus uh, one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also part of the Belt Road Initiative concerning, mm -hmm. you know, economic integration with the Central and Eastern European countries. Therefore, politicians and policymakers in Brussels have concerns that uh, perhaps China aims to divide the rule uh, to weaken the solidarity of the European Union. That's of course a nonsense from the Chinese perspective. You, you, your observation, please. May I give a third party perspective, maybe? Um, well, I would also, I think, the fact that the, mar the difference is actually a difference in attitude, mentality, a culture. When we, for example, when Western countries or many other countries compare the Belt and Road Initiative with the Marshall Plan, the assumption is that uh, any, such, uh, any such proposition should be very uh, strictly defined and determined. But actually the BRI is about consent. It's about initiating an idea and then the other partner country can be a part of it to determine what is good for them. It's flexible. And similarly, when you look at um, any kind of uh, reaction by European Union or certain countries that s seem to be threatened by the initiative, it's primarily because they don't understand the concept as well. And maybe it's partially because uh, this region, uh, maybe on some level, but my understanding is, was on the peripheries of the European uh, region. It was to some extent, no, I wouldn't say neglected, but detached from the Central uh, mm -hmm. European Union. And because of that, when China reached out to the European Union, just as you mentioned the Central Asian Republics uh, also, then it seems as if um, they are trying to d determine or emerge, China is trying to emerge as the more, uh, the bigger brother or the more significant uh, player or power. For, for that particular region. But this is, I think, what the European Union should realize is that uh, that's not the intention. The intention is simply because China recognizes that there are infrastructure basic requirements that countries need to fulfill in order to have overall prosperity. So I feel like it's more of a cultural difference mm -hmm. that leads to any kind of mistrust or misperceptions. On Last time. Sides the first forum of BRI, we saw absence of two heavyweight players. One was India, the other Singapore. But this time around, we are very happy that Prime Minister Li Xianlong came over, yeah. but uh, Prime Minister Modi yeah. refused to come. Uh, what do you think of, uh, say, the Indian concerns about the CPAC? They've long oh. complained that, uh, you know, Kashmir is a controversial territory for uh, India, therefore the label of uh, CPAC has aroused the strong nationalistic sentiments from the Indian media. They are so angry mm, these right. years. Uh, what do you want to say to your uh, Indian neighbors? My Indian brothers. Uh, well, I would ask firstly the question, is India not a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SCO? Pakistan is also a member of the SCO. And the SCO is compatible with the BRI, in essence. India is also a member of the AIIB again an initiative compatible with the BRI. The point is that many nations have differences but the differences have to be in one part of our imagination. The other aspect is let's, we should look for opportunities to be on the same platform to talk about points where we can agree and actually make a difference for people. India's opposition to the BRI I feel is not, it doesn't make as much sense because unless India is part of that platform, which has been created because of Chinese goodwill. There are so many other countries with such big differences that are probably even almost in the state of war. They are, they are participating in the Belt and Road Initiative because they realize that the future is common, that the goals that we have much more in common than we choose to recognize. So I think what India should consider is that if there is a solution to the current problems, then we are closer to that solution if we choose to continue dialogue, if we choose to support any initiative or any platform that gives us that space to discuss how to work together. Liu Chen, uh, we are clearly aware from the Chinese perspective uh, that uh, we need to uh, uh, introduce a, a reconciliation mm -hmm. and rapprochement between Pakistan and India, both of which are important business partners for BRI. Uh, Modi, Prime Minister Modi refused to come over twice. 
uh, what do you think of representation of uh, heads of state? Uh, only half of the number uh, who benefit from BRI mm. come over because uh, we have uh, less than 70 uh, countries and economists that would benefit BRI, but uh, benefit from BRI, but only 37 representatives that come over. What do you think of the issue of, rep of representation? Yes, there are not all the members along the Belt and Road countries come to uh, and come to uh, participate in our initiative, but we should know that the initiative covers about two thirds of all the developing countries, two thirds of the population. So they should be aware of that. Yes. So maybe in the future, give it some time, because uh, just uh, one of the last five years is only the childhood of the Belt and Road. But we should give it some time. It will grow out. out. Thank you so much. That's the end of this discussion about the influence of BRI and the issue of uh, representation. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.